Hello everyone and welcome back to Isaiah for Latter-day Saints. Today we've got some interesting stuff going on because we're getting into Isaiah 52. This is used all over the Book of Mormon, but it's used all over the Book of Mormon. There's not one really great place to get the whole chapter. You get some in 3rd Nephi, and that's great, but you also get some at the end of 2nd Nephi 8. You get some stuff, you get comments by Abinadi throughout Mosiah there. Uh, so it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit crazy. So we're going to jump around and we're going to pull it from different places. Now the third Nephi version appears to have been tweaked very slightly by Jesus because in the brass plates uh, in, in Second Nephi we get one, the last two verses there of Second Nephi 8 is Isaiah 52. But Jesus quotes those two verses and he quotes them slightly differently. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit hard to know what's going on. Jesus is probably tweaking it to fit the time and place. So this becomes very, very textually difficult. But we'll do what we always do. We'll look at other places in the Book of Mormon. We'll look at trends. Uh, if there's xenophobic tendencies, we'll, we'll be suspicious of those things. We, th this isn't our first rodeo with this. We've done this before. We know how to do this. You could probably, at this point, if you've listened to all of these, you could probably sit down and do this now with some of these chapters and you could probably do it with some other texts too uh, so we've done this for long enough we know how this goes so we're gonna jump around a lot here 3rd Nephi 20 we've got some 2nd Nephi 8 here we've got some Mosiah here we've got even some 1st Nephi there's a very interesting textual problem here in the middle of the chapter very difficult to translate um, but we're just gonna plow ahead so, this is the second Nephi 8 version of this. Awake, awake. Because remember, he said, you've been on the ground, and, and people have been stepping on your neck, right? The image of being defeated and people walking over your body. He says, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. <clears throat> this is, you guys have been on the floor being stepped on by these people. I'm telling you to get up. Put on your strength, O Zion. And put on your strength here is a little bit weird, but there's a parallelism. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. So get up, get clothed again, put on your beautiful garments. Be strengthened, Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Because the uncircumcised have come in. The unclean have come in and at least threatened Jerusalem. And he's saying, this is not going to happen anymore. Shake thyself from the dust. Get up. You've been on the ground. Get up. Sit down, O Jerusalem. So get up from the dust and sit down maybe on a throne, right, is the image. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Take these chains from off your neck. Now, when Jesus quotes it, he says, Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. So there's a, a slight difference there. Um, but that's the image that we're getting here, of them getting up from the ground and sitting down sort of enthroned. And that's sort of a beautiful image here. Now, as we continue this, we now have to jump to 3rd Nephi 20. And so that's going to be a little bit more complicated because, like I said, there's some quotations here, I think. We don't know how much Jesus is changing the quotation. He's Jesus. He can do what he wants. So we're going to have to sort of parse this here as we go through it. So this is... 3rd Nephi 20, 38. So Jesus is quoted in, in uh, 36 and 37, those first two verses we already got. And then he says, For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. He's saying, okay, you guys have sold yourselves for nothing. And we, he, he was just talking about that, right? For your iniquities you sold yourselves. So he says, you've sold yourselves for nothing, so you'll be redeemed without money. How are they going to be redeemed? God is going to redeem them himself through his own power. Verily, uh, verily, I say unto you that my people shall know my name, 
Yet in that day they shall know that I am he that doth speak. Uh, but what is that there? We're missing a little chunk. So we have to talk about what we think about this section. It goes straight from 3 to 6. Jesus goes straight from verse 3 to verse 6. So verses 4 and 5 are missing. So let's read 4 and 5 and see what we think. As for thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. It says, Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name is continually, my name continually every day is blasphemed. And then it says, Therefore my people shall know my name, yea, and that day they shall know that I am he that does speak. So there's a that chunk missing. So the question is, is this reference to Assyria, to Egypt, and Assyria original, or is it not? And honestly, it's really hard to say. We're gonna I'm gonna lay both options on the table. So this is my people went down into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now he could be this could just be a gloss giving historical examples of how this is going to happen. People were maybe confused about being redeemed without money. So this is explaining, well, you guys went down to Egypt. You guys have problems with the Assyrians. And she says, Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people's taken away for not? So you guys have been taken away for nothing. And they that rule over them make them to howl. My name continually every day is blasphemed. That these people are have caused the Israelites a lot of problems. However, it could just go straight from You've sold yourselves for naught and shall be redeemed without money, therefore my people shall know my name. So it's it's a toss up, but I'm I'm partial to those two verses being a gloss, and that Jesus, the version Jesus is giving us, is not him uh, pulling out those two verses because they don't apply anymore. I think these would have applied to the people. I think that there's enough cultural memory of the Exodus and stuff like that and the Assyrian conquest. They would have remembered it. So there's not necessarily a reason for Jesus to pull it. So I'm going to say those are interpretive glosses someone has included to explain that they've been sold for not and redeemed without money. Um, at least one interpretation. And this is the problem that we're, gonna, we're, we're getting here. Like I said, a lot of the language here is late biblical Hebrew. Not It's about half, right? So... Um, that's a problem as far as trying to figure out uh, what late stuff is inserted. I think this is some late stuff that's been inserted. So he says, Therefore my people, so, so let's continue, he says, For thus saith the Lord, you've sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Therefore my people shall know my name. Because they've been redeemed without money, because of the power of God redeeming them, they will know my name. Yea, in that day they shall know that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Because I'm the one that speaks. I'm the one that's doing this. Everyone will know the Lord because he has redeemed them without money. And then shall they say, because of this that he has done, that Jehovah has done, and this changes how we read a lot of what's coming up. Is How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings unto them of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Now we get this in 1 Nephi 13, Isaiah 12, Isaiah 15. So this, this whole thing is a little bit confusing. Um, what do you mean the feet? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet? Of them to bring good tidings? Uh, what is that even talking about? That's a little bit weird. Oh, and I should mention briefly, beautiful, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. That word here is Nauvoo. Uh, that, the word beautiful here is the word Nauvoo. It's a very rare Hebrew word, but it does mean beautiful, and, and this is one of the places that it shows up. So that's uh, sort of an interesting thing. But how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. Now, when Nephi quotes this in 1 Nephi 13, 37, 
He says, Blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion in that day, and whoso shall publish peace, yea, tidings of great joy. How beautiful upon the mountain shall they be. There's no reference to feet here. And I, he just says that those who publish peace are, are beautiful and refers to more than one messenger. I think this is because of a pun in Hebrew. So the word for feet and the word for infantry or foot soldier are basically the same in Hebrew. So Isaiah 57, 2, you can read it as, How beautiful upon the mountains are the infantry or foot soldiers or something that bring good tidings. Or the scouts, maybe, that bring good tidings. So this is, could explain why Nephi says nothing about feet and is talking about more than one messenger by the, the scouts or the infantrymen or the foot soldiers, the two foot soldiers, that bring good tidings. Um, so that could be what's going on here, that, that it's feet, but it's, it, maybe it's not feet. Maybe it's foot soldiers. There's this pun here of, yeah, somebody standing on the mountains bringing good tidings. There's something about the feet there that sort of works. But if it's foot soldier, if it's if the main reading that you're supposed to get is foot soldier, but then he's punning slightly on feet, the, the notion of feet that are usually not beautiful, they're usually very dirty and gross, and, and people running around barefoot or in sandals in the ancient Near East, they're beautiful because they're bringing good tidings. So there's this pun of foot soldiers and feet. And Nephi seems to be reading it as foot soldier, maybe. Um, but I, but I, uh, Abinadi reads it as feet, right? And Jesus reads it as feet. But I think that the pun there is, is supposed to be in play. So, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. Now, why are these people beautiful? Right? What is going on with how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings. So he says, "My he's saying that my people will know that it's me that is speaking but when I do this, when I deliver my people in grand fashion, when I redeem them without money. How is he going to redeem them without money? He's going to redeem them without money through his power. And then he says, my people will know my name and that day they'll know that I am he that does speak and then shall they say, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them, him that bringeth good tidings unto them. Or maybe the foot soldiers that, brings, that bring good tidings. That publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings unto them of good. That publisheth salvation. That saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Now what is he talking about here? Why is he, why is he going through this? Because... There's this image here of redeeming it without money through war, right? And so there's almost this image of the foot soldiers are bringing good tidings to the people that have been in this long war. And they're saying, they're publishing peace. They're saying, we have peace again, the war is over. They're bringing good tidings unto them of good, saying that everything is over now, the war is finished. They're publishing salvation. They're saying that, in other words, saying that, that we have been saved. The war is done now. It says unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It says to Zion, Jerusalem, but Zion can also mean fortress, something like that. Saying to the fortress, your God is king. Right? So, saying you have won the war and your God is king. Says, then shall their watchmen lift up their voice, and with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Um, this is sort of interesting, because in 3 Nephi, we're actually going backwards. Jesus is giving this in 3 Nephi, but it's scattered throughout the chapter. We get 37 and 38, 3 Nephi 20, 37, 38. We get 39, 40, and then we're going backwards to 3 Nephi 30, 32, and then we get 34 and 35. So he's actually <coughs> going through this chapter, but he's doing it backwards. Isaiah 52. Now, why is he going through backwards? In the ancient Near East, if you wanted to show that you were quoting something, you would often quote it in reverse order. Something called Seidel's Law. It's sort of strange, but it's what they did. And so Jesus is showing that he's quoting this 
by quoting it backwards. They don't always do it this way, but it is a valid way of doing it, and it explains why it's like this, because it's frankly kind of weird otherwise. And so, he says, Then shall the watchmen lift up their voice, and with the voice together shall they sing. So, the, the foot soldier has come and said, Hey, we won. Your God is king. We won. We won the war. So the watchman is lifting up his voice, and with a voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Um, now, what does that mean? Uh, seeing eye to eye. It could be they will see it easily. They'll see it in plain sight. It'll be straight in their line of vision. And for a watchman, that's important, right? The, uh, the watchman is seeing it straight in his line of sight. You're seeing the, the return of the Lord to Zion. And um, that's pretty beautiful. That's, that's a beautiful image. It says, Then will the Father gather them together again, and give unto them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. So this may be Jesus explaining what has just happened. Um, then will the Father gather them together and get and give them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. He's probably explaining this is what this means to see eye to eye. The Father will gather them together and give them Jerusalem again. That's, I think, the image here. It says, Then shall they break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Father hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. So he's saying, Jerusalem has, has been weighed, lace, weighed, laid waste, it's desolate, but he's comforted his people and redeemed Jerusalem now. Everything's going to be okay. As the Father hath made bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. And Jesus says, salvation of the Father, and the Father and I are one. So the Lord's going to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations. He's going to, making bare his arm, the idea of lifting up your sword arm, and, and your arm is now bare, because when you lift it up, your sleeve sort of falls down, in as much as they had sleeves, it's a, the clothes are a little bit different back then and everyone is going to see the salvation of God when he goes and fights for them and then it says and then shall a cry go forth <coughs> depart ye depart ye go ye out from thence touch not that which is unclean go ye out of the midst of her be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord <coughs> Now, go out from thence. What does this mean? The vessels of the Lord. What is he talking about here? Here we really need a fair amount of historical context to understand what is being said. Now, when we think of vessels, we're thinking of like maybe containers or something like that. But the word there is not necessarily vessel. It can mean vessel, but it can mean lots of things. It's like God's stuff, right? So... Stuff is not very uh, a useful word. We kind of have to think about the, the context. Now, we've been talking about all this military stuff through this chapter. Right? You have the foot soldiers that come and say, Hey, God won, and the watchman's lifting up the voice um, and seeing clearly what's happening, that God is winning. So he says, Break forth into joy. He's redeemed Jerusalem. All the desolation is... He's going to make these desolate places... Uh, fruitful again and comfort everyone he's made bare his eyes and all the, uh, he's made bare his arm in the arms in the eyes of all the nations he's going out and fighting for people they're seeing the salvation of god as he saves everyone through battle and then as then shall a cry go forth depart ye go out from thence touch not that which is unclean go ye out from the midst of her be ye clean that bear the vessels of the lord so the cry is saying go out Come out. You're not in bondage anymore. You've won now. Now, is these... So what is vessels then? This, in Genesis, there is a time where this word pretty clearly refers to implements of warfare. That uh, Esau gets his, his this word, Kelly, vessels, uh, and, and goes out to fight. <laughs> so clearly it's not bowls and stuff. In that instance, it's bows and arrows and things. So it could be... <laughs> that bear the vessels of the Lord, the the weapons, the specific weapons consecrated to the Lord as they're going off to fight. 
Uh, we, we know in Samuel that there are weapons in the temple that are consecrated. Uh, Goliath's sword is in the tabernacle, and David shows up, and he is able to use Goliath's sword. But these are weapons that are in the temple. So is that what they're talking about? Could be. The military context suggests that. Another option is that the idea is he's saying, guys, come back from, from where the Assyrians have scattered you to, and while you're at it, since the Assyrians have fallen, take the stuff that we used to pay off the Assyrians and bring it back. You guys remember this? So when the Assyrians come in, Hezekiah takes the stuff from the temple and actually is stripping the temple and using that stuff to buy off the Assyrians. And so he says, be clean to bear the vessels of the Lord. That, why don't you bring this stuff back with you? But you have to be clean because it's going to the temple, right? So you did have to be clean for ritual warfare purposes, but you would also have to be clean if you're bringing stuff back to put into the temple. So it's hard to know which is which, um, but it's, it's, that's the idea here. It's one of those things. It says, For ye shall not go out with haste nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your rearward. And rearward there is, is um, the idea of sort of guard, right, at, at the back of the military force. So that's what we're, what we're seeing here. And then he says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So his servant, who, who is his servant? My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So who's the servant? Once again, this is a little bit confusing, but I think this, he's talking here about Isaiah, but this is going to be applied to Jesus. And so that is sort of interesting, and we're going to talk about both interpretations as we go through here. You could also maybe say it's Hezekiah. We'll talk about all those things as we go through. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently and be exalted and extolled and deal be very high. He will do all the things that he's supposed to do, and he will be lifted up because of he's done the right thing. As many as were astonied at thee or astonished, um, we get that sort of surprise. It's astonished in the Book of Mormon. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And he's been through all this abuse and his, his visage is, has been marred. His face is so messed up because of all the abuse that he's been through. And so, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Now, what does that mean, sprinkle? It's a little bit odd. JST says gather. That's probably about right here. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which has not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. <laughs> And because of this, because of this amazing thing that's going to happen, God is going to gather these nations, and kings will be amazed. They never would have considered this, but now this is actually going to happen. And so that's what we get here. This is Isaiah 52, and once again, it's not that long, but it's sort of scattered throughout the Book of Mormon. We get this from Abinadi. Uh, because the people are asking him, well, how, what's this thing with how beautiful upon the mountains? So Isaiah, uh, or Abinadi has to explain what he's meaning. And actually what's interesting about that is that depending on where you put this place, uh, where Abinadi is at at the time he's contending with the priests, they may actually be in a mountainous area. <laughs> and so they're, they're thinking that the beautiful upon the mountains is them. And Isaiah is saying, guys, no, th these are the prophets. This is not you, right? And and the, the priest is saying, well, why aren't you bringing good tidings and publishing peace? And Isaiah and Abinadi says, because that's not what's on the agenda right now. You guys need to repent, right? And so there's this interesting back and forth between Abinadi and the priests that are using this chapter. Um, so like I said, this is used throughout the Book of Mormon um, because it's it's important. And, and you get this idea of the victory of God, that God has won this great victory over his enemies and has saved Israel. And they're able now to come back. But that does not mean 
that everything went perfectly for them. And so when it's my servant, it's really hard to know what it is. Is it Isaiah? Yeah, it could definitely be Isaiah. But could it be Hezekiah? It could be Hezekiah. Could it be the Lord? Could it be Jehovah himself? It could be. So um, it could also be Israel as a whole. So there is a little bit of confusion here, and nobody really agrees on who this is. So I am going to talk about multiple options. I'll give you the option I think is best, but we're going to talk about multiple options. So anyway, that's it for today, and that's it for Isaiah 52, and we will see you guys next time.